And uh, I'm excited to introduce to you this morning, uh, Christopher Hendricks. And so, uh, it, yeah, you can go ahead and celebrate already. So for those who may not know me, I'm Pastor Brandon Warner, and I have the privilege of being the senior pastor here at Together Church. And we're grateful to welcome Christopher Hendricks this morning and his wife, Corey, who is also here with us. And I had the privilege of meeting Chris uh, last fall through our mutual friends, Tim and Becky Miller. And we were able to grab breakfast one day at Sunnyside Diner here in the South Side and, and just get to know each other a little bit better. And then Chris came earlier this year and he spoke at a men's breakfast. If you were part of that, men, then maybe you remember Chris coming and sharing that message with us. Chris has 14 children and four grandchildren. Pause for audible gasps. Okay. <laughs> children are a blessing from the Lord and blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them is what the word of God says. So I mean, I get behind that. We have, we have six in our house. He loves his family he loves his church, he loves his community, and whenever possible, he loves to have cookouts, and he loves to go on road trips with his wife. And so this is a picture of Corey, his wife. Most importantly, Chris loves Jesus, and Chris has found a new life and a new freedom, literally, spiritually, and literally, physically, he's found this new life and new freedom. He's found a new identity, and a new purpose for living through a relationship with Jesus. Before Chris comes to share a message with, with you this morning, there's something that you do need to know about him. What you need to know is that it's a miracle that Chris is not right now this morning worshiping Jesus in prison. Chris was sentenced to a 74 year prison sentence, but his testimony is that he was freed from that prison cell by the power of God. Chris would tell you first that his freedom came not from the prison cell, but it was a spiritual freedom that came first before he ever saw the outside again. But through an incredible series of events, God made a way also for Chris to be freed from that prison cell. Not only that, but now, guess what Chris does? He works full-time as the executive chaplain for Oklahoma and jail ministries, and he goes back to those jails and prisons to share the gospel with people in those jails and prisons. Chris's story, especially the story of this uh, unexpected release, was a big enough story that it was actually covered by News 9. And we have to move, a, I think, move a slide over here, but let's, oh, we're ready? Let's play that a video. Man returns to where he was locked up in prison with an inspiring message of hope. He has quite the story. News 9's Mike Glover has his story of freedom. And tonight, something good. Imagine being sentenced to 74 years in prison. And for Chris Hendricks, that's possibly the rest of his life. But really, it just started with a series of wrong choices and wrong decisions. Those wrong choices would earn Chris a sentence of 74 years in prison for multiple armed robberies. And when I went to the Department of Corrections, uh, I simply took that time as time that was still valuable to me. While in prison, Chris earned his college degree with straight A's, even though it was very likely that he would spend the rest of his life in prison. Or would he? After doing a lot of reading and law books, and I discovered uh, something in my case that wasn't right. He was finally granted a new trial in the courtroom of Judge Amy Palumbo. She's looking at letters of recommendation from over the years. She's looking at certificates of completion. And according to court documents, it was one of the most extraordinary, compelling cases of redemption she had encountered in her career. In my case, Judge Palumbo, she made... Uh, the decision to give me a second chance. His new sentence was for the 12 years he had already served, essentially making him a free man. It was like a feeling like I couldn't actually believe what it was that I heard. Now a free man, he's the chaplain at the juvenile detention center and the Oklahoma County Jail, freely walking the halls that once confined him. When I interact with uh, inmates, I'm able to not only spark hope in them by giving them God's word, but I also convey to them my story. Now, Chris says he never would have gotten through any of this without the support of his family, and now he serves on multiple boards and committees spreading the hope that got him through. I'm Mike Glover for Oklahoma Zone News 9. Correct. Isn't that awesome? So that's who gets to bring a message to us this morning. I'm looking forward to it. Are you? 
Amen. So we're, we're in this series called The Search, and in this series, this is our last one in April, and in this series, we've been answering the question, how can I know God? And today, Christopher Hendricks is going to answer that question with a message called, Ready or Not, Here I Come. So would you join me in putting your hands together and giving a warm welcome to Christopher Hendricks. Thank you, Pastor Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody hear me okay? Yes. It is definitely good to be in the house of the Lord in any uh, respect. I want to give honor to Pastor Brandon for inviting me, the pastor of this flock, him and his wife, all the people that have treated us so wonderful this morning as we came out. I want to thank God for my beautiful wife, Corey, who is sitting right over there, as well as my mom. And we're just here to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you agree? And so, if you would, if you could stand for the reading of the main passage that we will be uh, using today, we will follow this reading by going to God in prayer, and then we will get started. Matthew chapter number 25, starting at the first verse. It reads as such. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. And it says, then the, king, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. After the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for yet another day. God, the fact that we are on top of the ground and the ground is not on top of us. God, we thank you for all the blood that is running warm in our veins, for life, health, and strength. God, we know that your word declares that it is in you that we live and move and have our very being. God, we thank you this morning. God, we thank you for your spirit. God, we thank you for what you want to do in this place and in this season. God, I ask that you would have your way in this service today. God, that you would move by your spirit. God, that you would break every stronghold by your anointing. And it is in Jesus' name I pray this prayer. Amen and amen. You may have your seat. Pastor Brandon, I thank you for the introduction. And you know, every time that I'm introduced that way, I want to be clear when I first come up here that it is definitely not about me. I stopped by here today simply to make sure that we collectively as a unit gives Christ the preeminence. Right? And so, as I was watching that clip of my life, it was, it's, it's always real humbling to me when I see that. Not only is it always humbling to me when I see it, but I'm always thankful to God for what he has done in my life. And we have sit here this morning and we watched the clip of my story, but the question this morning becomes, what is your story? 
as I looked at the clip, I began to think about where, what if my story had end where it begun? What if I hadn't had the opportunity or the chance to accept Christ? Think about where I would be. This morning, this is a word of self-examination. And I want each and every person that's here, whether you are saved or whether you are not, I believe that this word is fitting to you. And I want you to ask yourself, if it was all over today, how would my story end? Where would my story end? What is the last thing that God would have known about me? That's what I want you to have in your mind. You see, in Hebrews chapter number 9, it says this. It says, and as it is appointed for man to die once, but after this, the judgment. It said it is appointed for all of us to die once, and after this, there's going to be a time of judgment. You know, as Pastor Brandon was talking about uh, my children, I was thinking about how I was in a car with my wife one day, and as we were driving, uh, her phone rang, and it was the doctor's office, and they were talking to her about an appointment that was scheduled for my daughter. And while we was riding and they began to talk to my wife about this appointment, my wife began to tell them, no, this day will not work out. Can we put it off and reschedule it for this day? I want to tell you that Hebrews chapter number 9, the appointment that it's talking about is not something that you and I can reschedule. It is something that we got to make, and it doesn't matter whether you're ready to show up or not. When that appointed time comes, you have to be there. The Bible goes on in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verses number 10. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or or bad. I'm saying that there will become an appointed time and there's going to be an appointment that you and I have to show up to. And at this appointment, I don't want you to start focusing on your behavior right now. What I want you to focus on is at this appointment, it's going to be, have I accepted Christ or have I not? That's what this appointment is going to be about. When we go back to the main text that we were looking at, I want you to know the title of my message actually comes from something that all of us can relate to. Do you guys remember when we was in grade school and sometime they would turn us out for recess and we would go and sometime we would get together with other, ki- other kids and we would play a game called hide, go, see. And before whoever was the seeker went to look for everyone else, the last thing that that person would say would be what? Ready or not, here I come. I am telling you that right now is preparation time because when this appointed time comes, ready or not, Jesus is coming. He's coming whether you are ready or not because each and every day we are given grace and we are giving mercy and we are given long suffering by the Lord to be able to make a choice and a decision and sometimes we simply don't. In Matthew chapter number 25, I would like to point out in the very first verse, if you would notice that in the very first verse that we read, it said the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. But immediately in the very next verse, it says, now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. What am I saying this morning? I'm saying that it tells us five was wise and five was foolish. However, in verse number one, it says all of them went out to meet him. This is the thing. If Jesus showed up today, would you be ready to meet him? When you sit there and examine yourself, do you ask yourself, would I be the wise or would I be the foolish in the equation? Think about this. 
Verse number one, it says that all of them went out to meet him. You know what else? All of them had the exact same look. Do you understand what I mean? All of them was virgins. All of them looked the same, but they wasn't the same at heart. What, why do I bring that up? Because it's one thing to say I'm devoting time to come to church or to have fellowship, but I want to ask you this. Am I coming to church and I'm really just trying to look like everyone else? Think about that. Meaning, I know what people at church do, I know how to show up to a building and have the look, but what I'm trying to say is according to the text, God knows the difference. He knows the difference. Whether you are wise or whether you are foolish. Let me ask you this. It's a simple question. And it's a question that should be posed to self because the person to your left or the person to your right was not the person that died for your sins. Ask yourself this, will you be ready when Jesus comes? Will you be ready? When we look at Matthew chapter number 25 and we talk about examining ourselves, for the sake of the passage, we're going to talk about the all being that of the gospel of Christ. Sometimes we have been uh, privileged to have God send all kind of people to us over and over and over again. People have come and ministered the gospel. Grandmother has prayed right? Mother and father have raised us up in va vacation Bible school. Perhaps you're not even a person that was raised in a family that was church, but God had the football coach at school tell you. Because that's how God works. He wants to make sure you have the opportunity. The question is, what have we been doing with the opportunity? You know, I want to tell you real briefly something that I experienced during the, the day at my day job, being the chaplain at the county jail, as you guys just saw. And I want you to kind of take this moment in. I was at the county jail, Oklahoma County Jail, and I received a phone call at my desk from the medical staff there. And they said, there is an inmate that is up here in medical. He is barely responsive. But the last thing that he did say to us before we was able to talk, uh, uh, before he wasn't able to talk, was he wanted to see a chaplain. So I want to paint this picture in your mind. I get on the elevator and I go up to the medical unit. And as I'm in the medical unit, uh, something surreal happens for me because I'm a person that knows what a jail cell feels like. I get to this jail cell and I open the door. And as I go in this jail cell where everything is made of metal and steel and concrete, I see a man laying on the bed and beside his jail bed, he has all kind of machines hooked to him. He has an IV drip next to him inside a jail. And he is deathly ill. And so I began to talk to him and he began to barely open his eyes and I began to right up front tell him the truth. This conversation can be about nothing else. This is an urgent moment. This is about whether I am going to accept Christ or whether I'm going to reject him. I began to minister Christ to the man. And as I ministered to him, he would come in and out and go in and out. Anyway, long story short, the next day, he ends up passing away. The very next day. When he passes away, his family reaches out to me and they said, we heard that you was the last person that spent time with our loved ones. Would you be willing to come out and do his funeral? I said, absolutely, I would. I would love to come out. 
And so I go out and I do his funeral, but the reason I tell you uh, this story is because I want you to know that there's many people that we know and many people that's in the world that right now, while everything is fine, they have the uh, ability to accept Christ. They can and they won't. Why am I saying that? Don't allow yourself to get to a place where you actually want to, but you can't. Do you know what I mean? See, this morning, if I would have came in here and I would have handed everybody a debit card that had money on it, and I said, listen, this is your personal card. Just spin it until it's gone. And you said, well, how much money is on it? And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you. Just spin it till it's over. And so one day you spend 10 grand, next day 20 grand, next day 500. The day will happen where what's going to happen to that car is going to decline. I'm letting you know that that description I just gave is just like our life. The day will come where there will be no more days for us to draw from. Life will come to an end. And I will have to make my appointment. And I will have to give an account of what I did in this body, whether good or bad. And the Bible uses the word all. That means all of us in totality, no exceptions. Verse number four in Matthew 25, it says that the wise had all. Ask yourself this morning, would you be classified in the category of the wise or the foolish? Okay, in verse number five, it goes on and it tells us in verse number five, look what happens. It says, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumber and slept. What I'm saying is Jesus had been delaying his coming right now because he's merciful and gracious to us. First, second Peter three, verse nine, it says this. It says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's a choice. I get to choose how my story ends if I take advantage of the time that God is giving me daily. Right here, right now, in the present, I can take advantage of it. When we look at Matthew chapter number 25 in the latter part of the chapter, it goes on and it tells us, beginning at verse number, number, number nine, it says, but the wise answered saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. They tried to get prepared when it was time to go. Right now is preparation time so that when Jesus comes, we are already ready. You know, I remember back in high school, if you remember, you may have had a friend that had a car or something like that, but you didn't have one. So since he had a car and y'all was friends, every day he would drop by and pick you up for school. You would, he would get to your house and either you would look out and recognize the car and go right out, or he would pull up and blow the horn and you would come up, come out. What am I saying this morning? I'm saying that Jesus is expecting us to be ready when he gets here. He's not going to pull up and blow the horn. Because right now, he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I tell people this all the time, that hell is not a bad word. Hell is a bad place, and Jesus warned us not to go there. We can choose to go somewhere different. I can choose to accept Jesus Christ and the, the uh, payment that he made for my sins on the cross. And I'm telling you, until you get that part down in your spirit, don't even be worrying about your behavior yet. Do you know why I say that? 
Because if you could fix your behavior, Jesus wouldn't have to come. Do you understand what I mean? But Jesus did come. And Jesus is the shaper, and Jesus is the molder. It's about my submission to him. When we look back at Matthew chapter 25, verse number 11, it says, Afterward, the other virgins came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. It would be a sad testament to have had the opportunity to receive Christ and didn't. Or rather, I've been coming to church all of this time and I just look like everybody else, but my heart really ain't with with Christ. That would be the worst experience I think one could have on Judgment Day is to hear, I've seen you try to look like everyone else, but I can tell your heart is really not like them. If you could stand before Christ and he was to say, you had many opportunities to receive me and accept me, but you accepted everything else. The Bible goes on to say, in Matthew chapter number 25, looking at verse number 12 again, it says, but he answered and said, surely I say to you, I do not know you. Verse number 13 is a message to you and I this morning. Something that we're supposed to be carrying out right now in the present and we are supposed to be doing this each and every day of our lives. Verse number 13, it says, Watch therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. If we were to go back up to verse number 6, verse number 6 talks about how when he came, it was at midnight. Do you know what midnight signifies there? Midnight signifies an unexpected time. What is all of us normally doing at midnight? Normally we're asleep. We're not alert. We can't be ready. So the Bible uses the word midnight because it's saying that guess what? You have to be watchful, you have to be ready, and you have to be prepared. The Bible tells us all throughout the Bible, the New Testament, Either we are in Christ or we're not. If any man be were in Christ, he's a new creature. We're at in Christ. It says, but you are not of the flesh, but of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God is within you. We have a part to play in this. And our part that we're playing in this is our response to what Christ have done. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, starting at the sixth verse, I want to hammer this point home a little bit more. The verse says this, 1 Corinthians 10 starting at verse 6, it says, Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. When you look at your life and when you look at all the people that God have sent to you, do you stand in the place of a person that can say, I've heard the gospel of Christ repeatedly, but I'm going to stay in a place of tempting Christ. I'm not going to accept it. You see, I want you to know that there's two spiritual forces at war for one soul. Two sides. Even though we can't see into the spiritual realm, I want you to know that God is fighting for your soul and Satan is fighting for your soul and it comes down to who are you going to submit to? Which way are you going to go? Satan doesn't want to convince you that there's no God. He's not trying to do that. He's trying to convince you that there's no hurry. 
He's trying to convince you that, you know what, I'm only 19, I'm only 25, I'm only 40. I got plenty of time to fix it and get it right. That's the trick of the enemy. Making us feel like we have time. When we look at the fact that at any moment our time could run out. You and I don't know when. The question then becomes, how can I know God? Right? The question then becomes, how can I know God? And, and now notice this. I, I want to I wanna press this in with urgency and importance. When we talk about how can I know God, I'm not talking about just a knowledge of God, being able to tell people a lot of information about God. None of us will make it into heaven because of intellectual agreement. You know, I watch sports sometimes, and I could tell you a football player's number. I could tell you his name, whether he's married or not, where he went to college at, what pro team he plays for now, what position he played for. The fact of the matter is, I can tell you a lot of information about him, but I don't know him, and he doesn't know me. See, it would be a whole different thing if I was to say, you know what, I went over last night and I was able to sleep on Kevin Durant's couch. That's a different kind of no. We will not make it into heaven based on intellectual agreement. When we talk about how do I know God, I want to make it as plain and as simple as I can. I want you to know that you know God by faith and acceptance of the gospel. When I say that, someone must, might say, well, okay, I hear what you're saying, preacher, but what is the gospel? I don't want to give you my answer I want to give you the Bible answer. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, if we look at verses 1 through 4, Apostle Paul is writing to the church that's at Corinth, and he says this in verse number 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, if you hold fast. Do I have some people that are holding fast this morning? Do I have some people that are like the Bible when it says, uh, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Do you know that the word if is in the Bible 1,522 times? And every time it's, it's used, there's a response that is supposed to happen by you in reference to what was said. Apostle Paul says it is not enough to just start this, but we got to hold fast the profession of our faith. We got to hold on to it. Again, in verse number two, he says this. He says, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you unless you have believed in vain. He goes on and tells us exactly what the gospel is. He says, for I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the what? To the scriptures. It says, and that he was buried, and that he rose again in the third day according to the scriptures. What is the gospel? The gospel of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. I have to decide, do I believe that by faith, and am I going to continue to try to fix me, or am I going to let Christ fix me? Because he's the savior of all. The Bible says that he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Right? He who begun a good, a good work in you, he shall see it to completion. 
For the Bible declares, it says, he made him who knew no sin become sin for us that you and I might be made the righteousness of God. I'm telling you, if you are in a place today where you are going back and forth today, I am telling you this morning, if your person say, well, I never have ever heard the gospel or nobody has ever preached the gospel to me. If you find yourself in that category, I want you to know after today, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. As I think about this life and what it could be, I got home one day and I was talking to my wife about an experience that I had. I got called by a funeral home. And uh, they asked me, they said, well, pastor, we was wondering if you could come up here. And the reason we want you to come up here is because there's many people that pass away and some of them don't go to church. They don't know a pastor, right? They don't know anything about God. And so when their loved one pass away, they're kind of in a panic mode because they don't know a preacher, a pastor, a minister, none of that. So they said, we was wondering if we could put you on our list so if a funeral ever needs to be done, you could come up here and perhaps officiate the funeral for us. So I went, and then when I went, they gave me a tour of the whole funeral home. I saw stuff I wasn't even expecting to see. I got to go even in the garage where they parked the hearse. I got to see bodies that was on metal tables in bags that hadn't even been prepared yet. But you know what I noticed? And this is what I talked to my wife about when I got home. The whole time I was there doing that tour, everybody that I saw was young people. I didn't see elderly people when I was there. I saw people that was young, people that perhaps thought I got so much more time. In fact, the day that I was there, the funeral that was being had was a young man in his early 30s. I'm telling you that if you are going to gamble with anything else, don't gamble on whether you're going to receive Christ or not. Hell is way too long to be wrong. It is. Are you a person that's sitting right where you are and you might be thinking, man, I'm right just like I am. But I really know that people have been ministering to me Christ and I haven't been accepting it but my life is kind of going good I mean I got a nice job I, my, my, my family is doing all right I got a nice car nice houses all of those things I think I'm being I think I'm doing pretty good I'm telling you this that everybody who hasn't accept Christ is doing bad everyone see we came into this world wrong all of us Jesus have given us the opportunity to leave right. That's right. But we have to choose. We have to pick Jesus over everything else. Is that my utmost importance in life is honoring him, giving him the preeminence. Preeminence is nothing but a big word that means first place. Are you giving Christ the preeminence in your life? Or do you still want control? In the book of Revelations, chapter number 22, looking at verse number 10, I want to give you a warning before we come down for a landing. And in Revelations, chapter number 22, earlier I spoke and I said that after today, there will be no excuse for everybody that's under the hearing of the word of God. Not me, because guess what? I needed the same Savior as you. But I'm telling you that there will be no excuse if you leave today and you decide that I'm going to reject Christ that I don't want to accept Christ. I don't want Christ to rule and reign in my life. 
Revelations chapter 22, looking at verse number 10, look what this is saying right here. It says, and he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And it says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every one according to his works. What is, what is being said here? This is saying if you are not prepared and Christ comes back in whatever state you are in, you might as well stay that way because it's too late. He's saying whatever state you are in, if he shows up, go ahead and stay that way still. Go ahead and continue being that way because I didn't pull up to blow the horn. You were supposed to be ready when I came. This is why I gave you opportunity. This is why I poured out long suffering and mercy and grace and all of these different things. But you let me catch you at midnight. You let me catch you when you wasn't prepared. Again, I want you to think about yourself. We watched how my story started and where my story is now, but I want to ask you about your story. If today was the last day, how would your story end? Would it end with Christ or would it end without him? The last verse that I'm going to read today before we come down for a landing if you could, I would like everybody to stand and I would like Together Church's invitation team to come down, if you would. And as we've talked about a lot and we've mentioned so much today, I want to tell you that this is not a moment where I want you to chance it. This is not a moment where I want you to gamble with it. This is not a moment where I want you to say, everybody will be looking at me if I go down there. I'm telling you that this is a war for your soul, for eternity. And you say, well, pastor, you, you told us what the gospel was according to the scripture. What does that look like in application?" In the book of Romans, chapter number 10, looking at verses 9 and 10, let's look at the application. It says that if you confess with your mouth, this is something that you are doing. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I'm telling you that this same chapter says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The invitation team is up here to give you an opportunity to cry out and call on the Lord, but I want to explain this text just a little bit farther. You see, the application of this is twofold. It deals with two different things. It deals with your mouth and it deals with your heart. You see, because God is a lot like us and he understands that the, a pair of lips will say anything. Right? So what God does is the Bible says that God doesn't look at the outward appearance of man as we do, but God is a God that looks at the heart. So when you come down and you make your confession, what God is looking at is I am looking to see if your heart matches your mouth. I'm saying if it have never been real to you before ever in your life, let it be real right now. Let it be real right now. Don't leave this place with it in the balance. Over 2,000 years ago, I want to tell you that there was a Jesus that came down through 42 generations, the root of Jesse and the seed of David, and he came down just for you. And when he came down, guess what? They mocked him. And when they mocked him, he didn't say a mumbling word. Do you know why? Because he was thinking about you. They grabbed some thorns and they put it on his head. And he still never said a thing. Because Jesus was busy thinking about you. 
They stretched his hands far and wide and they put nails in his hand and they put nails in his feet. The Bible even says before that, they beat him until he was marred so bad he was unrecognizable. He still never gave up the fight for you and I because he was thinking about you the whole time. Even if you're a person that don't feel like you need to be saved, but you say, I need to come back and get in my rightful place. I need to rededicate my life to God, back to God, and be where he calls for me to be. If that is you, I want you guys to start coming this morning. I'm telling you that God is waiting. He is waiting. If you do not know Christ, God is waiting on you. And the Leaders of the church are here to receive you. I'm telling you that the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his son that if you would just come and believe. Don't worry about the person to your left or to your right. Remember, I told you that this is about faith. If it's you this morning and you know that you need Christ, this moment is for you. There is still time to come. Don't put it off to tomorrow. Tomorrow might be too late. Today is the day for salvation. 